Thanks, Anthony. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here and uh, uh, to talk about such an optimistic topic. It's nice to uh, to focus on something that is positive. And if you look up the definition of optimism, it says a disposition or a tendency to look on the more favorable side of events or conditions and to expect the most favorable outcome. Uh, I think that uh, being optimistic is something that as a broker it's probably injected into your DNA when you're born because you have to be optimistic in this business. Um, but we're living at a very, very unusual time. Uh, the confluence of politics, economics, and real estate has never been more closely tied. Uh, and I think if you were a, uh, a high school debating team, you could have a field day with commercial real estate today because I think you could make a wonderful argument that we should be pessimistic about what's going to happen in the future, but you could also make a great argument that things are going to be optimistic moving forward. And so we've assembled a great panel today to talk about the optimistic side of things, and I just wanted to kind of give a, a macro framework on things that uh, I'm sure the panel will build on. Um, first, let's take a look at some of the things that might be a little negative, and then we'll, we'll shift to the positive stuff. Uh, firstly, uh, unemployment. Uh, there is no metric that more profoundly impacts the underlying fundamentals of both commercial and residential real estate than unemployment does. Uh, in this past recession, we lost 8.4 million jobs. Uh, the job growth has been well below expectation coming out of a recession. Uh, you have to bear in mind that the unemployment rate itself really is irrelevant. Uh, the unemployment rate does not calculate in people who are unemployed and have stopped looking for work for 30 days. Uh, it doesn't count people who are working part-time that would like to be working full-time. Um, and so what's most important to look at is the actual number of jobs that are created. Uh, and we need about 150,000 jobs created a month just to keep pace with population growth. So we haven't seen anything close to that yet. Uh, we'd like to recapture some of those 8.4 million jobs. Uh, but without significant growth in, in job creation, it's going to be very difficult for, for our fundamentals to get better. Uh, when jobs are created, people move out of mom and dad's house. They move from a one bedroom to a two bedroom. They move from a rental apartment to buy a place. Uh, companies start hiring more people. They want more office space. Uh, people get a job, they'll go out and spend more. It's good for the retail sector. So employment is very, very key. Um, housing market is something that also gives pause. I think in, uh, in New York City, we've been very fortunate uh, that our housing market has not um, been on the same track that it, the housing market has been nationally. Uh, clearly, when you have the massive amount of government intervention that we've had in the housing market uh, via the first-time home buyers tax credit and the moratorium on foreclosures, you have artificial stimulus that didn't let the market really clear. And so what are we seeing now in the housing market nationally? We're seeing a double dip. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and that's a problem because our economy is 70% consumer-based. For most consumers, their house is their number one uh, asset, and to the extent they don't feel they have equity in their home, they're not going to go out and consume as much as they would otherwise. So the housing market is something that gives us reason for pause. And then uh, lastly, on the pessimistic side, our interest rate environment is something that is of significant concern. Um, and interest rates are one of the positive things about our marketplace today. But unfortunately, we've had a situation where uh, in order to meet budget deficits, the federal government has three options. They either raise taxes, which they're reluctant to do. They cut spending, which they don't have the guts to do. Uh, or they print money. And in every case, the government has decided to print money. So our money supply has more than doubled uh, and is continuing to increase, that has to have inflationary pressure at some point. Uh, we have a Federal Reserve that has had its balance sheet triple in the last two years. Uh, the Fed has only four mechanisms for getting out of the market. All four of those will exert tremendous upward pressure on interest rates. And think about what the real estate market would be like today if interest rates were 150 or 200 basis points higher. Uh, that is not an out outlandish presumption uh, by the end of the year. Uh, we hope that doesn't happen. But those are things to watch out for. So forget about the pessimistic stuff. Let's talk about the optimistic things in the market. One, uh, corporate profits are at an all-time high. Uh, during this recession, 
corporations cut to the bone. They eliminated overhead, they cut staff, uh, they cut their space to the extent they could. Uh, and so corporations have been making tremendous amounts of money. Today there's $1.8 trillion sitting on corporate balance sheets. So corporations are not hiring, and they're not hiring not because they can hire, they're strategically choosing not to. Um, but corporations have been making a ton of money and to the extent they decide they do want to hire and grow, they have the ability to do that. Banking sector is very, very healthy today. Uh, the Fed's highly accommodative monetary policy has allowed for a recapitalization of the banking industry. Uh, the top 20 banks in the country are very highly capitalized. They also have the ability to lend, although they may lend a little more conservatively than they had in the past. But the banking sector is very, very healthy. And then the two things that I think have been the most stimulative and the most optimistic for our building sales market and our real estate market in general um, is that we have had this very, very low interest rate environment. Um, rates are uh, at historic lows. Uh, it's very easy to get long-term fixed rate financing today on income producing properties. Financing is coming back uh, for construction. Uh, and so the interest rate environment has been very, very healthy. And then this, the second factor that has been very positive for the market is that we have a very, very acute supply-demand imbalance. Uh, there is never a, an oversupply of property available for sale in New York. In fact, if you look at the Manhattan market over a 26-year history, the average turnover of buildings for sale is only 2.6% of the total stock. That means that on average when someone purchases a property, they hold it for, 20, for 40 years. So there's never a lot of property available for sale and what we've seen on the demand side of things is that the, the institutional capital that really helped to inflate the asset bubble in 05 to 07 essentially evaporated when we tangibly started to feel the effects of the credit crisis in 2007. Uh, and so most of the transactions that we had done from mid 07 through the end of 09 were sold to high net worth individuals uh, and to the old New York families that have been buying forever. Um, but we've seen a reemergence in the beginning of 2010 of that institutional capital. So today, we have institutional capital that has come back uh, dramatically. We have the high net worth individuals and the New York families that are continuing to be aggressive. Uh, we have foreign investors that have come back to the market in numbers we haven't seen since the mid-80s. And so this, this tremendous demand looking to buy, and there really is not an oversupply of properties. Banks and special servicers have started to dispose of of distressed assets, but they've been doing that very methodically, very slowly. We were all expecting a couple of years ago for this tsunami of distress to come into the market the way it did during the SNL crisis in the early 90s. That never happened. Uh, we're seeing slow rolling waves of distress, uh, but the demand is such that it keeps absorbing whatever supply comes to the market today. So from our perspective, the biggest problem we have is we don't have enough property to sell. Uh, if we had more buildings available, we'd be able to sell them very quickly. But those things, low interest rates and all this overwhelming demand in the marketplace has created dynamics that are very, very positive. So I'm looking forward to hear, hearing what our, our panelists have to say today. Um, I'd like to, uh, to introduce uh, everyone uh, to the, my far right, your left, is Norman Sterner. Uh, Norman, I think it, it goes by the title of Mr. Optimism. Uh, he's always very, very optimistic about New York. Um, Norman's the founding principal of Murray Hill Properties and is the president of the firm. Uh, to date, he's acquired and sold more than 100 properties having an aggregate value in excess of $10 billion. Uh, to Norman's left, my good friend, Ofer Yardani. Uh, I think Ofer and I co-broke the deal together in the early 90s on uh, West 28th Street. Gail, you represented Gail Chung, Ofer. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, Ofer has uh, completed over $3 billion of transactions in the city. Uh, he's the managing partner and co-founder of Stonehenge Partners. Um, he began his, his real estate career as a broker and has evolved into the uh, the top one of the top uh, 
purchasers of multifamily properties in the city. Uh, he's acquired properties with over 2,400 residential units and over 750,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, to Ofra's left is Ira Schumann. Ira is the executive vice president and co-branch manager uh, for Studley here in the city. He began his career in 1978 and he's completed over 10 million square feet of office leases in the city, representing such tenants as Sullivan and Cromwell, um, uh, City University of New York, New York Public Library, Patterson Belknap, and the list goes on and on. He's also a winner of Rebney's Most Ingenious Deal of the Year Award in 2010. Um, to my left, it will save, save Jim for, uh, for the last. All the way down at the end, uh, I don't know who this guy is. Who is that? That's uh, uh, Paul Massey. Uh, I have to say, Paul has been my, my partner for 27 years. Uh, not only is he uh, one of the top brokers in New York City, but he does an unbelievable job managing and directing our firm. Uh, great dad to his children. A uh, great mentor to the young folks at our office, and uh, I'm honored and privileged to uh, to have been his partner for 27 years. Um, to Paul's right, uh, Rob Lapidus. Rob uh, is president and chief investment officer, co-founder of L and L Holding Company. Uh, that company was formed in June of 2000. Uh, to date, uh, L and L has distributed over 700 million dollars in profits to its investors. Uh, Rob uh, runs a portfolio that consists of about 5 million square feet uh, of office properties, primarily in Manhattan, and that portfolio has a value in excess of $3 billion. Uh, and then lastly, our, uh, but not least, our uh, moderator for today is Jim Carolyn, who is a partner with Withers Bergman. Uh, Jim leads the U.S. Uh, real estate practice for the firm and handles both residential and commercial transactions. Uh, his highlights include uh, several financing transactions in excess of $100 million. He's done ground leases, office leases, retail, uh, and closed luxury residential transactions, including one of the largest in the history of the United States. Uh, so Jim, it's my pleasure to turn the panel over to you and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say.